Well, as you get settled in, would you take up your Bibles and turn to Titus chapter 1 this evening? Titus chapter 1. It's our fifth study in the book of Titus uh, tonight, and we'll be uh, beginning in verse 10 today, and we'll read down through the end of the chapter in verse 16. All right, Titus chapter 1 and verse 10, the scripture tells us this. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. We've got a lot to cover. How many people here know the, the little nursery tale of Little Red Riding Hood? You kids know that one? When she went to visit her grandmother, the big bad wolf knew that she was coming. And so he got rid of grandma. He disguised himself to look like grandma. And he laid down in bed and pulled the covers up, right? Little Red Riding Hood may have suspected that something was out of order, but in the story, she kept inching closer and closer, commenting, My, what big eyes you have, Grandma. <laughs> the better to see you, my dear, answered the wolf. My, what big ears you have, Grandma. The better to hear you, my dear. Finally, Little Red Riding Hood said, My, what big teeth you have, Grandma. And the wolf replied, The better to eat you with, my dear. And he leaped out of bed to grab her, and uh, Little Red Riding Hood barely escaped with her life. Now, if it were a real story, she wouldn't have escaped alive because a little girl doesn't defeat a wolf. The moral of that story is that without the protection of discernment and the protection of good leadership, you put yourself in serious jeopardy. Discernment will keep you from flirting dangerously with enemies who want to destroy you. And many of God's people need to take that lesson to heart very carefully. History is full of examples of religious frauds and religious wolves who wear sheep's clothing and prey upon God's flock. Some are masters of deception and masters of disguise who talk like Christians, use the Bible, seem like nice people, and portray themselves to be so loving. But they'll draw you in to eat you for dinner and destroy you. They vary from the more obvious, such as, sexual predators and embezzlers and tax evaders and liars and extortioners on one end of the extreme spectrum to those who just seem like they undermine or compromise a few little doctrines and practices from the Bible. But when you begin to examine any of their fruits, whichever end of the spectrum they're on, when you begin to discern their teachings in light of the scriptures and you trace out their doctrines to their conclusion, then those folks are readily identified for what they really are. Now the scriptures show us that there are many false teachers who profess with their words to know God, but they deny him by their works. That's going to be the focus of our study this evening in this passage of scripture. They could be right here among us if we're not vigilant. Satan has always been active in raising up false teachers to oppose the truth from the very beginning. And they always start from somewhere. Sometimes it's uh, egregious and sometimes it seems fairly innocent. In our day, of course, the number of cults and false religions that profess some link with Christianity is astounding. Uh, Mormonism is one of the fastest growing religions in the entire world. The Jehovah's Witnesses have their tentacles in countries all over the world. 
they're thriving, they're growing, they both profess some affinity to Christianity, other cults are thriving as well. At the same time, on the opposite end of the spectrum, maybe a little more innocent as far as we're concerned, if we're not careful, many of those who claim the Baptist name, and even more specifically, the independent Baptist name, no longer stand for the faith once delivered to the saints. They compromise what historically makes Baptists what they are. It was happening in Crete. There were many deceivers, according to the Apostle Paul in verse 10. Now, because the enemy is so incredibly active in promoting destructive heresies that may start out in a seemingly innocent way, churches desperately need to be skillful in the word of God. All of its membership needs to be skillful. In particular, we've seen that God has established the office of elder in churches to teach truth, to watch for and discern error, to provide critical oversight for God's flock. Now, all of the people within a church should be growing to a high level of competence and proficiency in their handling of Scripture so that all in a church are involved in the work of guarding against error. But the oversight provided by those appointed to the office of elder must especially be appreciated and welcomed according to the Scripture. We've considered the critically important mission of Titus. Paul had specifically left him on the island of Crete to identify and appoint elders in every one of the churches. We've already considered their function. We've already considered their qualifications earlier in this chapter. We've seen that elders must be men of godly character with a mastery of the word of God who vigilantly guard the flock of God. A major part of the responsibility of elders, according to verse 9, is this, and this is what leads us right into our text, that they must hold fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Why is that so important? And why is that so urgent? Well, verse 10, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. In our text here, Paul shows that elders must guard the flock by refuting false teachers and by correcting any believers who have followed false teaching or who are beginning to follow false teaching. Now, frankly, folks, this is never a pleasant task. It's never a pleasant task for me. If you've been involved in it yourself, it's not a pleasant task. Maybe you've been involved on the giving end. Maybe you've been involved on the receiving end. It's not a pleasant task. It shouldn't be abrasive, but it is confrontational just by nature. Personally, um, just, just telling you my, my liking and my way of, of uh, how I would prefer to do things, I would always rather focus on the positive. But to merely stop there is disastrous for those who need this corrective guardian ministry brought into their lives. If the world were free of all disease, we wouldn't need doctors and we wouldn't need hospitals and we could all live happily ever after, or so we might think. But we know that the world isn't like that. It's pervaded with many serious diseases, fatal diseases, debilitating diseases. And so we desperately need doctors. We can't bury our heads in the sand or fail to address legitimate medical needs or it results in catastrophe for those who desperately need care. And if the spiritual world were free of spiritual error, then we wouldn't need pastors and we wouldn't need elders and other of God's people to confront and correct these deadly spiritual diseases. The world isn't like that either. And so pastors and elders and leaders in churches uh, must confront, they must guard the flock by exposing and correcting the many errors that just keep creeping into people's lives and they keep creeping into churches it's a continual process we have to always be on guard about that and always be on the lookout when they come in and recognize them for what they are and deal with them accordingly to fail to do so is to leave people without the uncomfortable but critical work that god must do in their lives if they're ever going to be saved or if they're ever going to be salvaged and so, a couple of things that we learned from our passage of Scripture tonight. First of all, and remember the context is elders that were appointed, particularly in local churches there in Crete, so that they could do this work. Elders must guard the flock by refuting false teachers. That's our first thought here for tonight. Paul tells Titus unequivocally 
These men must be silenced. They must be silenced. Verse 11 says of them, whose mouths must be stopped. Hmm. Now, he's obviously not talking about physically restraining them. <laughs> but while it might not be possible to talk them from physically speaking, it is possible to stop them from spreading their errors within a church. That would obviously include guarding the pulpit or any teaching venues from false teachers. That's kind of obvious. But that's not generally how false teaching is initially propagated within a church. Here's how it generally happens. False doctrine infiltrates smaller groups in a church. It comes into homes. It's propagated there. And then it spreads to other families that they're friends with or that they know or that they develop some affinity to. And so Paul says that these men subvert whole houses. To subvert means to upset or to overthrow. It is to overturn or imbalance something. And houses refers to families. These are church families that it's talking about that were getting destroyed and carried away by these false doctrines and by these false teachers. Smaller groups tend to give false teachers and false teaching a more convenient setting in which to spread their lies. They're generally careful to disengage from elders to disengage from mature believers and to disengage from larger group settings where they'll likely be called out by somebody who has some discernment. And so false teachers seek to get the ear of an individual or of a family to study the Bible with. They prey on individuals. They prey on families who are spiritually immature or aren't well taught and they seek to draw them in. Frequently, they seek common ground with somebody who's offended about something or who's vulnerable because of something that's taken place in their lives. This is very serious business that we're talking about here. Paul's addressing it head on without beating around the bush at all. It must be taken seriously by a church and by church leaders. It must be taken seriously by those who recognize that they're still in the maturation process. They may be vulnerable to that type of thing. And God gives a tremendous number of resources to a church to clearly present truth and expose error before it has a chance to take root and to begin to destroy. Now, I want you to note two things about such false teaching. First of all, false teaching always damages people. It always damages people. Heresy, which is anything that runs afoul of scripture, is cruel because it damages souls. And so to confront error is really a tremendous act of love. If you care about people, you can't let them go into destructive heresies without carefully and diligently warning them about it. As I mentioned in the last study, there are movements afoot all around us that claim doctrine is not important. There are many who lean on personal experience rather than doctrine. Of course, any person must have a very personal experience with God as they're brought to a clear knowledge of sin and responsibility to him. And then they must cast themselves on the mercy of Jesus Christ as their only hope of salvation. That, that is certainly a personal experience that I hope everybody here has experienced for themselves. But if an experience is based on false doctrine, which seems to be very common in our day and age, then it's not the true Christ that they're experiencing, but a false Christ. Paul said that those who stop short of teaching a gospel that lays the crushing weight of personal sin on the sinner and that stop short of bringing clarity about personal trust in Christ as the only hope for peace with God are preaching another Jesus. There are other Jesuses that are preached out there. The ecumenical cry to everybody just come together and center around Christ is not an honest cry. There are different Jesuses that people worship. And so uh, there is nothing that could be more important than that. Those who stop short of that are damaged in the worst possible way. And they're left with an incomplete gospel that won't save anybody. But they're given some false assurance. Nothing could be more disastrous than that, folks. I hope that you can see that today. Beyond that, many churches fail to teach proper discipleship and principles that lead people to spiritual maturity. And as a result, many in churches are left in an inept, fledgling state of spiritual infancy for years, decades, scores on end, and never amount to anything in their fellowship with God or his service. 
terribly damaging. Further yet, most churches fail to preach and teach local church doctrine. Having moved into the nonsensical and unbiblical universal invisible church ideology, and that leads churches to be incompetent in their ministries and leave those who don't know Christ without a solid foundation for personal responsibility to a local church. As a result, they're never able to grow spiritually. They're never able to be fruitful for the Lord to the full extent of their lives. False doctrine damages people. Sound doctrine is essential. Another thing that we should note about false doctrine is that the greatest danger for false doctrine always comes from within a church. That's the greatest danger. That is the most likely place for it to come from. These false teachers professed to know God. That's what we see in the verbiage here. No doubt these false teachers were likable men, popular men. Satan is smart enough not to use men who look like evil villains. Nice false teachers have you over for a meal. They invite you into their home. They invite you to their gatherings. Everybody makes you feel like you're a part of their group as they try to reel you in. But their teaching is deadly. Our text reveals at least three ways that elders must refute false teachers because they are so dangerous and because there's a tendency for them to arise from within churches. Three ways that elders must refute false teachers. First of all, they must refute false teachers by teaching sound doctrine. Refute them by teaching sound doctrine. Paul said in verse 9 that elders must be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Gainsayers are those that mock at, scoff at, or try to undermine the truth. He goes on to tell Titus in chapter 2 and verse 1, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. In chapter 2 and verse 7, he commands Titus in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Now, I certainly don't get the impression that we are to downplay doctrine, do you? In just a couple of short verses, he emphasizes the need for uncorrupt, pure, sound doctrine again and again and again. Rather than always focusing on the false, um, elders must emphasize sound doctrine or true doctrine. Because if you handle the right thing and you become expert in it, it's really easy to spot and reply to the wrong thing when it rears its ugly head. It shows itself as a stark contrast. When the government trains agents to detect counterfeit money, they do so primarily by having them study genuine money and the characteristics of it. And if those agents know what the real thing looks like, then they're able to very quickly and easily spot counterfeits. Now, as I've said before, the word sound comes from the Greek uh, hugeano. It's, it's spelled almost exactly like the word hygiene. We get our English word hygiene from it. And it means to be clean. It means to be healthy. Uh, kids, your parents are probably always hounding you to wash your hands and practice good hygiene. Don't stick your hands in your mouth. Don't go and lick the pole at the church where all the other kids are, are touching and stuff. So be clean. Be healthy. Sound doctrine is healthy doctrine. It leads to healthy spiritual growth and to maturity. Preaching or teaching that does not confront the cancer of sin is not sound doctrine. If preaching or teaching just feeds curiosity, if it just focuses on positivity, it's not sound doctrine. Properly delivered, Scripture should lead to the fear of God as it's delivered, and it should lead to holy living, not to mere speculations and opinions about things. And so elders must refute false teachers first by teaching sound doctrine. But sometimes it is necessary to focus on false doctrine to warn the, the flock. And so we also see in our scripture that, that elders must refute false teachers by exposing their false teaching as well. That is a critical function of an elder. There's a common notion today that it doesn't matter what you believe, just as long as you're sincere, as long as you believe something. It's absolute nonsense. It couldn't be further from the truth. You can believe with all your heart that you can jump off the edge of the Grand Canyon and fly, but believing that is not going to enable you to fly. It won't happen. It's the same spiritually. Spiritual truths have been revealed to us 
by God through his word. And many spiritual falsehoods come to us from Satan, the father of lies. And so those are the two streams or the two sources. Paul says very plainly in verse 14 that these teachers, note this phrase, turn from the truth. They turn from the truth. That's not just the work that they do, but that's what they themselves have done. This means that spiritual truth is knowable. It is absolute. It's confrontational. It's brought to people's hearts and they choose to either receive it as absolute truth from God or they choose to believe lies and they turn away from God's truth. Now, we don't know the extent of the errors of these false teachers in Crete, but we can deduce that they were promoting at least three common errors that we see all through the New Testament. Paul specifically mentions them by name and part of his work, even as an elder in helping that church and what he was telling Timothy then as an elder there to teach other elders so that they could teach to their churches or call out in false teaching were these three areas. First of all, false teachers always add works to the Bible's teaching of salvation by grace through faith. They always do, folks. It, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look around and examine different world religions and even those that claim to be uh, some affiliation with what would be called Christianity and see that they add works to the Bible's teaching of salvation. Paul refers to them in verse 10 as they of the circumcision. Remember, he says that their mouths must be stopped. For there are many vain talk, there are many unruly vain talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Those of the circumcision were a group of Jewish people who also claimed to believe in Jesus as Savior. You better believe it. They ran around and infiltrated churches all over the Mediterranean world in Paul's day. But they insisted that those who professed faith in Jesus were also obligated to keep the Jewish ceremonial and dietary laws to be saved. They especially taught that men had to be circumcised to be saved. They couldn't bring themselves to accept Gentiles into their churches on the basis of repentance from sin and faith in Jesus Christ alone. They also required that those Gentiles lived like the Jews and practiced like the Jews. Now, Paul and Barnabas had a tremendous dissension with such false teachers. They bumped into them all the time. They confronted them all the time. They called them out by name. There was one instance particular recorded in Acts chapter 15 where Paul and Barnabas, it says, had no small disputation in, in the church assembly at Antioch with these fellows that were coming in teaching this. You must be circumcised after the manner of Moses to be saved. And so... They said, where did you guys come from? And they said, oh, we came from the church at Jerusalem. They sent us here to teach that to you. <laughs> well, Paul happened to know a little bit, and Barnabas happened to know a little bit about the church at Jerusalem. They were both members there at one point in time. And so they said, well, we're going to go and get to the source of this. And so they traveled back to Jerusalem. They had a meeting together with the church at Jerusalem. And at that important meeting, they opened the scriptures together. Scripture was agreed upon by all parties involved that all people, whether Jew or Gentile, are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus apart from the keeping of the ceremonial law of Moses. But in spite of that decision, and in spite of the, uh, the, the, the church in Jerusalem plainly saying, no, we don't have anything to do with those guys. We didn't send them out from us. They're not, they're not our ambassadors teaching that. Despite that, these zealous Jews kept promoting their errors. They especially dogged Paul's steps. Paul would plant a church. They would follow on almost immediately and infiltrate and begin to teach their insidious doctrine. And they would go into those churches that Paul had founded. They would pervert God's gospel of grace. Now, Paul writes against them often. He especially writes against them in the book of Galatians where he says, If anybody preaches another gospel requiring anything to be added to repentance and faith in Christ for salvation, let him be accursed. It's in Galatians chapter 1 verses 6 through 9. He uses very, very strong language there. Let him be accursed. Satan is always introducing false teaching about God's way of salvation. Always. It is the prime focus on his part. It's what he wants to pervert and destroy. If he can do that, he can keep people from being saved. Scripture's clear that the gospel is not designed for man-centered purposes, folks. 
It's not designed merely to let people escape the judgment of hell or to just enjoy the blessings of heaven. It's not designed to enjoy God's wonderful plan for your life or to provide your best life now. Here's what Satan seeks to blind people to through these cheap imitations. Scripture teaches us that the gospel is designed to address the rottenness of man. And the lifelong war in which every man, woman, boy, and girl are in against God because of their sin. That's what the gospel is designed to do. It's designed to show the hopelessly corrupt condition of our hearts. It's designed to bring us to our knees as we acknowledge how God truly sees us. That is the repentance or the change of mind that God expects a person to have as they come to the knowledge of the truth. When a person takes such personal and heartbroken responsibility for their sin, then humility enters in instead of pride. Humility comes in and it enables them to be able to trust and cling for dear life to Jesus' sacrifice for their sins. And so, as a result of that, Scripture is abundantly clear that saving faith is not merely intellectual acknowledgement of the facts of the gospel. Even the devils are able to do that, and they do. God expects it to go far beyond that. God expects personal trust that completely commits the life and the eternal soul to him. That results in dramatic change. Those who claim that Christ can be your Savior and not really be your Lord have bought into a false gospel. Not even a good imitation, a totally false gospel. They muck their way through life with no holiness, with no obedience, because they're spiritually dead and not alive at all. Scripture is clear that genuine salvation includes repentance, and it results in a life of good works and holiness because the person has been changed from the inside out. Now, other false teaching goes to the other extreme, and it adds human works. So we have these perversions of the gospel that have infiltrated many churches, but this other extreme that we have today adds human works to saving faith as a necessary condition for salvation. In addition to faith in Christ, false teachers say that you must add your own good good deeds. Uh, You must be baptized. You must witness. You must keep the Sabbath. Go to Mass. Whatever. You, you, You name it. Anything outside of faith in Christ. But Paul is very clear that we're justified by repentance and faith in Christ apart from anything that we would contribute. All right? And so we're talking about Uh, what false teachers are characterized by in their false teaching. First of all, they add works to the Bible's teaching of salvation by grace through faith. And so that's the first group that Paul deals with here. They of the circumcision, their mouths have got to be stopped. They're ruining people. They're destroying entire houses. Further, uh, secondly, false teachers fail to focus on the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's how you can easily identify them through their teaching. Paul said they gave heed to Jewish fables in verse 14. Jewish fables. That's probably the same error that Paul refuted in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 4, where the false teachers gave heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. That probably involves fanciful interpretations and stories built around some of the Old Testament genealogies and the rabbinical traditions that the Jews were really authoritative about. Paul says all of that is just mere speculation. There's no substance to it. It's fables. It it didn't further godly edifying, which is always going to center around faith in Jesus Christ. Every false religion from the first century onward has erred on the person and work of Jesus Christ. Some have said that he's God, but not truly man. Others insist that he's a man, but not truly God. Others say that he's some type of hybrid God-man. And and they have some really oddball ideas. He's part of both. Many have said that he's our great example and teacher but they've denied the necessity of his shed blood as the atonement for our sins. All false false religions supplement the Bible with their own writings, with their own fables, with their own traditions, 
with their own authorities, which invariably contradict the Bible and supersede the Bible when you really begin to pin them down on it. But if we're going to honor God, we must believe in the Bible alone as our, authoritatively, as our authoritative source of truth. And all of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation centers on the person and the work of Jesus Christ, who's the eternal God, who took on human flesh to die as the substitute for our sins on the cross. Thirdly, the false teachers promote what's called legalism rather than God's grace. And that ties into the other ideas that we've already touched on a bit. But Paul says that these false teachers promoted the commandments of men in verse 14. Legalism emphasizes outward conformity to rules as a way to obtain righteousness rather than the need for God to work inward change in the heart, which is naturally going to result in obedience to the commands of God. Legalism always appeals to the flesh. It always appeals to the proud human heart and feeds it, the heart, uh, the human heart in its natural condition, wants to think that it can obtain righteousness apart from being humbled before the cross. Legalists congratulate themselves for doing their religious duties and they self-righteously condemn those who don't do those things. But they fail to judge the sin in their own hearts and they fail to see the real underlying problem in the hearts of other people that may be committing those sins. They're not really seeking to please God from the heart. And that's what verse 15 refers to in our text. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and their conscience is defiled. Now, Paul is not saying there, he doesn't mean that if you think something isn't sinful, then it's okay. <laughs> Rather, He's referring to the Jewish ceremonial and dietary laws. The false teachers claimed to be pure because they kept those rules. In God's sight, they were unclean because their minds and their consciences were defiled. They'd never been cleansed inwardly. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse our consciences so that we can serve God. Now, Paul's making the same point that Jesus himself made in Mark chapter 7. We don't have time to turn there and look at it, but in verses 1 through 23, Jesus indicated that the Pharisees, uh, he, he indicted uh, rather the Pharisees because they kept all their man-made rituals, but their hearts, he said, were far from God. Jesus said the external things such as eating certain foods couldn't defile a man. That was nonsense. But rather what defiles is the sin that comes from the heart. Now the cults today and those who teach false religion today may not be into Jewish dietary laws too much. There are still a few around. But invariably, they are into legalism. They teach that you can somehow commend yourself to God by doing certain man-made commandments and make yourself feel better. You can soothe your conscience. But they don't deal with the defilement of the heart because they deny the cross of Jesus Christ. By the way, um, the concepts of legalism which would be uh, obtain righteousness by doing all of these ritual behaviors and licentiousness or just license and liberty to live however you want to in whatever depth of sin you want, um, those may seem like they're kind of at opposite ends of the spectrum with God's grace being somewhere in the middle. A lot of people try to portray it that way. That's not the case. Uh, legalism and licentiousness are two sides of the same false religion coin. They're both false religions. Both of them are rooted in the flesh. Neither one produces godliness. That's why when Jesus reproved the legalistic Pharisees of his day, he said this, Matthew 23, 28, even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. The word iniquity literally means lawlessness. You're trying to act like you're keeping the laws outward, and maybe you even are keeping some of the laws outward, but inwardly, you're complete lawbreakers, total hypocrites. And so um, these religious legalists were actually lawless in their hearts, but God's grace is opposed to the flesh because it comes through the Holy Spirit. It's the opposite of everything fleshly about us. 
uh, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14 is going to dig into this, and it's going to show us very plainly that God's grace results in true holiness, both inwardly and outwardly. And so Paul is showing us here that elders must refute false teachers by teaching sound doctrine first. They must... They must refute false teachers by exposing false doctrine very plainly. Thirdly, they must refute false teachers by exposing their sinful behavior. So their, their sinful or their false doctrine, but also their sinful behavior. Bad doctrine will always result in evil behavior, folks. It'll always happen. On the surface, false teachers often seem like nice moral people. Sometimes... The veneer of morality is due to their legalistic efforts that they're making. But as Jesus pointed out to the Pharisees, legalists look uh, like beautiful whitewashed tombs on the outside, decorated. But inside, they're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. That's what their works are going to be. I want you to note how Paul describes the behavior of these false teachers. Verse 10, they were unruly. That word means rebellious. We looked at it back earlier in this chapter when we considered the, the uh, qualifications of elders and how their children cannot be unruly. They can't be rebels. Well, here, false teachers are rebellious, and that's always at the root of false teaching. There's always rebellion that it's tied to. Sinners refuse to submit to God's word, and so they invent teaching that fits with their sinful lifestyles or desires. Further, they're vain talkers and deceivers, according to verse 10. Like a dishonest salesman, they could talk well, but their motive was to deceive for their own advantage. They had ulterior motives. They wouldn't state it outwardly, but it was very evident through their lives. These men were greedy, according to verse 11. It says they were teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. False teachers often exploit their followers milking them for money, more and more money all the time, and impoverishing them while the false teacher gets first class all the way. Furthermore, he says in verse 12, talking about their works, their fruits, that they ought to be called out for and identified by. Verse 12, they are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Now, the description of liars is obvious enough. Not only did they fail to teach truth, but they were also constantly dishonest as they sought for their own gain. Evil beasts refers to being like wild animals. In fact, that's what it, that's what it literally means by interpretation. It's especially talking about their passions. A lot could be said of that. It doesn't take looking very far into history of corrupt religions and corrupt religious leaders to see all of these things very evident. So I'm not going to go into details about it tonight. Um, uh, wild or evil beasts. Slow bellies refers to being gluttons. Has to do with indulging and feeding fleshly appetites to the fullest. Continuing to look at their behaviors. Verse 15 says that they are defiled. And they're unbelieving. That's really the most important descriptor. Verse 16 says that they are abominable. That word means to stink. They're disobedient and reprobate. The word reprobate means worthless. When it comes to producing any good works. So a litany of bad works and bad fruit that we just noted that Paul explained to us. And and ultimately concluding with they're devoid of or unable to produce any good works. Now, false teachers are not usually so honest as to come right out and say that they are atheists or antichrist. There have been a few that have said that, but they usually don't do that. Rather, in verse 16, it says they profess that they know God. They're claiming that verbally. They're maybe saying a lot of the right things, but in works they deny him. 1 John makes it clear that the true test of genuine faith is actually our behavior. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it says, And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. That's not keeping his commandments to get saved. It's keeping his commandments because we are saved and God has produced holiness in us. He goes on and says in verse 4, 1 John 2 and verse 4, He that saith, I know him, 
and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Jesus said that you can identify these wolves in sheep's clothing by their fruits, not by their verbal professions in Matthew chapter 7. And so one of the unpleasant but necessary tasks of elders is to guard God's flock by refuting false teachers. But also, secondly, and, and this will be a short point and I'll be done, elders must guard the flock by correcting any believers who have followed false doctrine. So we've dealt with false teachers. Now we're talking about church members. Any of us that may have started down the path to receiving believing or practicing some false doctrine. Now, there are many ways of doing this correction, but Paul mentions two things. First of all, uh, we as elders, we must correct any believers um, who have followed these false doctrines by warning of cultural trends and tendencies. Cultural trends and tendencies. In verse 13, Paul does this. He cites the Cretan poet Epimenides. He's a man who lived about 600 BC. I talked about him just a little bit in our introduction to this book. Paul calls him a prophet. And by calling him that, he doesn't mean that he was a true prophet of God like we studied about on Sunday. He's saying that, uh, that, uh, that he was one that they recognized as their own prophet who himself denounced the Cretans. By quoting a Cretan against the Cretans, Paul really strengthens his point here. The quote encompasses uh, the famous liar paradox. And this is what it says. The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. All right. And then Paul says this witness is true. So that was the witness of the Cretans. Um, the, the liar paradox is, is that um, if it was true that all Cretans are always liars, and a Cretan said that all Cretans are always liars, then he was actually lying while he was speaking the truth, right? And so there's just like this paradox that can't be explained away. Well, Paul's making a, a, a tongue-in-cheek point here that Cretans are generally liars, evil beasts and gluttons or slow bellies, just as their own prophet confirmed. And so he's telling Titus to warn the Cretan believers within those churches about their cultural propensity towards these sins, those sins that marked false teachers so that they would not involve themselves in the same sins. They had a tendency to fall into those things on that island. Now, we quickly can ask, what trends would Paul warn us about if he lived in our culture? Those are things that we need to be talking about, so I hope that people aren't offended when I bring things up in the preaching and teaching. That's what we're seeking to do. People think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. No doubt about it. In our culture, there's an overemphasis on what's called self-esteem, where we tell every person that he or she is a winner, even though it's not typically true, so as not to damage their self-esteem. Tolerance and being non-judgmental are supreme virtues of our culture. That's what's promoted and preached above all else today. In culture's eyes, the main sin is to say, this is right and that is wrong. Materialism and overemphasis on leisure are major cultural sins. I could mention plenty of other things too, but just don't have the time. Ultimately, we could say that we're all prone to swim with our cultural stream. We all have a tendency to do that, just like the Cretans did. One way, or there's a couple of ways that we can counteract this, many ways in fact, but just very quickly, one way to counteract that I found is to read godly authors from the past, from other cultures, from other generations that lived according to the scriptures. They had their own cultural stream, but since they weren't swimming in our stream, they often expose errors right here in our day, and it's amazing to see almost how prophetic many of those things were. Most importantly, God has given elders to local churches to identify and warn of these matters. So how, uh, how are elders to correct believers who may follow false doctrine, have begun to follow false doctrine, or have a tendency that way? Well, correct and warn of, uh, correct by warning of cultural trends and tendencies. And secondly, correct by convincing strongly of the importance and the narrowness of the truth. Convincing strongly of the importance and the narrowness of God's truth. Paul writes in verse 13. Note this. 
Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. That's what really indicates to us that we're talking about folks right from those churches that were having a tendency to fall into these problems. Rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Them refers to false teachers, of course, because we've mentioned them in the context. But being sound in the faith, it refers to believers who've bought off on some things and they need to be corrected. They need to be helped so that they're not destroyed. To rebuke means to refute. It means to convict of errors. It means to convince someone to do it sharply. The word sharply means abruptly. It means to do it curtly, to do it precipitously. <laughs> Just like somebody might cut something off with a single blow from a sharp ax. You don't correct error by hints or by nice suggestions, but by directness. Remember, being sound here means spiritually healthy. It implies that if you don't correct these spiritual errors, like a serious disease, they will lead to spiritual demise. They'll lead to the demise of a church. They'll certainly lead to the demise of families and of individuals. The faith. Re rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. The faith points to a well-defined, narrow body of truth a specific body of truth. We can know when we or others are in it, and we can know when we or others turn away from it. These false teachers were clearly evidenced by turning from the truth. We are to correct people so that they are sound in the faith or in the truth. Christopher Columbus was stranded in Jamaica, and he needed supplies. He knew that there was a lunar eclipse that was going to occur the next day. And so he told the tribal chief in the area, unless you give me supplies, the God who protects me will punish you. The moon will lose its light. When the eclipse darkened the sky, uh, the primitive people were terrified and Christopher Columbus got all the supplies that he needed. In the early 1900s, there was an Englishman who tried the same trick on a Sudanese chief. He said, if you don't follow my orders, vengeance will fall upon you and the moon will lose its light. The chief replied, if you're referring to the lunar eclipse, that doesn't happen until the day after tomorrow. <laughs> well, that Sudanese chief was protected from deception because he knew the truth. It's the job of elders and it's the job of mature church members to protect the flock from deception by teaching God's truth and by refuting Many false teachings that prey upon the untaught in our day, just like they did in Paul's day. And so, let me conclude with this simple statement, folks. If biblical correction is brought to your life, appreciate it and receive it. It's for your own spiritual health. And be engaged in this good work of correcting those, calling out uh, false doctrine for what it is, and promoting sound doctrine. We want our church to remain healthy, spiritually healthy, in every respect. Let's pray. Father, we give thanks for the